This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the unplugged NFC hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are going to talk to uh, we are going to talk about identity and reputation with Tim Pasteur. He is an entrepreneur, and his startup is called Two Way dot IO. They are building on a protocol called Identify, which tries to build uh, a next generation decentralized identity and reputation network. So first, we'd like to begin with an introduction from Tim. Tim, can we have your intro? intro? I uh, used to work in IT from uh, age 17, um, and I worked my way up from, uh, from a help desk uh, support engineer all the way up to IT manager. Um, and I got interested in Bitcoin uh, relatively early on. I was already working on complementary currencies uh, before Bitcoin, uh, but it took me a while before I really un- understood the importance of, uh, of Bitcoin and uh, the whole aspect of decentralization. So somewhere in 2013, I um, I started thinking about the idea of what if we could decentralize identity? So what if we could issue our own identities without having a government or anybody else uh, issuing it for us? So we could decide for ourselves uh, which data and which communications we want to link to our own identity or identities. And that's how it all started. And Somewhere um, uh, halfway 2014, I bumped into Marty Momi, uh, also known as Sirius within the Bitcoin community, who was the first developer after Satoshi to be working on Bitcoin. And um, when I bumped into him, um, I asked him, when do you think we'll see a, a truly decentralized uh, identity and reputation network or, or something that comes close to that? And then he showed me Identify, and it didn't take me very long to... Uh, to see that that was actually something I was looking for and I was trying to come up with. Uh, and he was already several steps ahead of me. Um, so from that moment on, I got really interested in Identify. And I think about three months later, I quit the day job to uh, to work in this full time. Okay. So uh, you, you've talked that we don't have a really good decentralized identity system today, but we do have centralized ones like I don't know, Facebook, some some people might construe Facebook as an identity system and you always have the government ones. What are the big challenges with these systems that you think necessita- necessitates a decentralized solution? Well, for example, if you look at uh, Facebook, you uh, just to mention one because it basically goes for most centralized identity systems out there. Uh, when you look at Facebook, then you create an identity on their platform. So thereby it basically becomes their identity. Um, And anything that you upload to Facebook is linked to your identity, Um, but they will always keep ownership of that. So I think that's a a big problem because this way you don't have any control over your own data, uh, over your own communications. For example, when I uh, log into Facebook, uh, the connection itself is encrypted. Then I send you a message, and on your end, it's decrypted, but Facebook will always have the master key, so they will always have the ability to uh, to decrypt that information. So this way, there's no real there's no real privacy, there's no real encryption because um, they always will have control over that information. So I think that's a big issue where it comes to uh, to centralized identity systems. Um, and another issue, uh, but that's that's mostly social identities because there are several types of identities. You have your the identity that you are yourself, uh, which which lives inside of your head. Uh, you have your legal identity, so that's probably then the the one that's being issued by the government, for example. Um, and you have your social identities, um, such as Facebook, etc., but also in the offline world. So there are several types of identities, and nowadays most of them are issued through centralized parties, so you don't have any control over that. And they basically also have control over the revocation of any of your identities because they can simply just pull uh, your identity and um, from there on you have no control over it anymore whatsoever. So this way people, they, they, people have the illusion that they have their own identities on the internet, but most of the time they, they really don't. 
No, so I guess uh, uh, as a thought experiment, you could say that the only sort of decentralized identity we have is the one that we construct ourselves. Like if I, you know, tell this group of people that uh, I'm a startup founder and I tell this group of people that um, I train like particular martial arts and I tell this group of people that I like kittens, um, mm -hmm. well, that's the identity that I construct and then I'm the one that controls that. So in a sense, uh, that's... Probably the uh, up until now, uh, up until we have these decentralized systems, probably one of the only forms of decentralized identity that we have, right? Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, so, so when you when you name that example where you tell people different things about yourself, it's where you, the user, uh, in an electronic fashion, it's it's a user, the person uh, has control over what information they want to share with other people, and that's that's basically the only decentralized form we have right now. And decentraliza decentralization really means that each uh, party, so in this case, each identity can control for themselves which information they want to share with, uh, with other parties. Um, so the user has to be in control in a fully decentralized system. So with all these traditional centralized types of identity systems that, that we've mentioned so far, we've mentioned Facebook, we've mentioned government IDs, and, and there are others. Um, what are some of the problems that we see there? Uh, you know, identity theft is obviously one of them. What, can you talk a bit about that and perhaps some of the other issues that, uh, that these systems uh, present? Yes, of course. Um, when you look at identity theft, for example, it's, it's mostly because... Um, if I want to have my identity verified by a certain party, so if I want to trade, say, Bitcoin on a certain website, um, then sometimes they require me to send a copy of my identity documents. Um, there are basically three issues with that. The first one is that physical documents have security features. And as soon as I make a photocopy of that, the security features disappear because that's the whole idea of the feature. Um, so as soon as I send anybody a copy of any of my physical documents, um, the security features disappear. So you will never be able to really verify if that, that's, that's a real copy or if it's Photoshop. Um, next, you will have to send it over a communication channel where it can be intercepted um, by a man-in-the-middle attack, for example. So um, that's the second issue there. And then the third issue is that once it does arrive on the other at the other end of the line, um, then it all gets stored in a central database. So this way um, you create an information silo with a lot of sensitive information, with a lot of sensitive data. And when you do that, you become a target to hackers. So the whole thing, the whole idea here is that if you don't have to process and send sensitive data, then the, the chance of becoming a target for hackers also decreases. And if somebody, let's say I create an identity, which is uh, verified by a bank, for example, I would simply have in a decentralized system such as Identify, I would simply have a public key with a verification from uh, signed by the private key that belongs to the public key of the bank, for example. And then it will only say that I'm over 18 or that I'm a citizen uh, of a certain country. So if somebody steals that, then they will only know that a public key belongs to a person that lives in a certain country or is over 18 but they won't have my social security number then, they won't have my date of birth or any other sensitive data that can be used for identity fraud. Uh, identity fraud. So uh, you've, you've mentioned the Identify protocol in, uh, in this conversation. Can we know what, what, what it exactly is? All right, yeah, sure. It's, um, it's not very easy to explain because it's a relatively new concept. Um, the software itself, Identify, like I said earlier, was created by Marty Momi. Uh, he started working on this uh, back in 2013, and the software itself is a fork of the Bitcoin daemon. Um, so it uses the, the, the same sort of uh, networking mechanism. Um, it uses the same sort of command line interface, JSON RPC API, the same public key cryptography. But what it doesn't use is um, a mining proof of work scheme uh, or an objective logic consensus. Um, so the major difference is that there is no blockchain. So if I uh, store anything within my own database, I will simply connect to other peers in the network. I will start flooding this information to other peers on the network. And if another node trusts me, then they can sign the public key of my node 
And from that moment on, they can verify any information that I'm sending, and thereby they choose to store it in their own database. That's a very brief summary of, uh, of how it works, but feel free to ask because it's a bit of an abstract concept at the moment. Yeah, so so first of all, let's 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 go to one key difference between Bitcoin and Identify, which is that in Bitcoin there's a consensus mechanism and a global database that that keeps let's say an objective record of truth. Like mm -hmm. you know what has happened in the network till now because you can look at the database and 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 see all the entries in it. In Identify, there is no consensus, which means there is no central global view of truth right right so um there is no objective consensus so when you look at bitcoin you want to make sure that coins haven't been spent before um, and the majority of the network is basically always able to agree on whether coins have been spent or not when you look at nakamoto consensus so this is purely about objective logic but where it comes about where it comes to identity uh it's mostly all subjective logic and with subjective logic, the problem is that a majority of people will probably never agree on whether a certain statement about the world, uh, an identity, uh, is true or false. So I could say that blue is a nice color, but you could deny that. Um, I could say that you are a good person, a good barber, or a good car salesman, and somebody else could refute that information. So that's why the, cons why the consensus mechanism itself uh, doesn't work like uh, it does for Bitcoin. And so the consensus mechanism is purely subjective. So I could verify, for example, that your Facebook account belongs to you. Somebody else could deny that. And then anybody who has me in their trust network will see that I have verified that your Facebook account belongs to you. But if somebody else has denied that, then the people within their trust network will see that according to the people uh, or the, the person they trust, um, that they say that it is not true. So in, in a sense, what you're saying is like in, in Bitcoin, if you are a node, you have this one database that is the global record of truth. And you can verify that that global record is correct because you can always verify the proof of work. In, in Identify, when I'm running an Identify node, I basically have to choose a set of peers and uh, I can see what what these peers have done in the past, like who these who these peers have approved as being good or not being good. And depending on my peers, I develop my own view of the of the world, the world meaning the identities and reputations of other people. And all of the users of the identity system can come to different conclusions conclusions about the state of the world. Yes, that's correct. So um, like, like the example I mentioned with the barber, um, when I'm looking for a barber, I may be looking for one which is cheap and nearby, um, but somebody else may be looking for a barber that is just very good and they don't really mind to travel really far or pay a lot of money for that. So if I say a barber is good, then the people within my network <clears throat> pardon me, will probably uh, know what I mean by that or they will have their own interpretation of what I mean by that. And this is where the subjectivity comes in because um, what's true for one person can be false to another one. Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin at the Ledger offices, and I met with Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevêque, so he could tell me all about the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. The Ledger Wallet Chrome app is the perfect companion app for your Ledger HW1 or Nano. We have very powerful and cool features. You can use multi accounts, for instance, personal accounts, business accounts. This is very useful. Also, when you want to make a transaction, we use a second factor verification. You can either use a physical security key or cryptographically securely pair your Android or iOS smartphone to your nano. This way, when you issue a transaction, a payment, the transaction will pop up on your Android or iOS phone and you will be able to verify the amount and destination address. Finally, the Ledger Chrome app has an API with which you can easily integrate third-party applications. For instance, if you want to create a multi-signature account with CoinKite or Copay, it will be done using the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. 
Ledger is making hardware wallets easy and convenient without compromising on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. If you are actually not using global consensus, then why are you using the Bitcoin D software at all? How, how, why, why are these two things linked at all? Um, well, I think uh, right now I have to speak for, uh, for Marty, the, the, the man who uh, developed the software itself. But when I look at the, the networking mechanism, uh, so the way you connect to other peers, the way information is being flooded to the network, that's basically uh, for, for a large part the same as how the Bitcoin daemon works. Um, the same goes for the public key cryptography, uh, the command line interface, the, the, the JSON RPC API, etc. So there are a lot of uh, similarities between the two, but the, yeah, the major difference is the, is the mining mechanism or the Nakamoto consensus. So, so basically what he, he had this technology that had many of the components that he was looking for and, and, and used some of those components to, to be able to identify while removing the Nakamoto consensus, uh, objective consensus mechanism and replacing it with a subjective consensus mechanism, which can, can, subjective consensus, can, can we call that reputation? Is that synonymous? Um, yeah, you could see it as reputation, but reputation is more than just what I say about you. Um, so it's more than saying if a person is a good barber. Reputation is also if I um, verify or deny, deny that a certain connection belongs to your identity. Um, so it's, 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 it's much broader than just um, um, giving ratings, for example, like you do on eBay or, uh, or on Uber or Airbnb. Okay. And so I'm interested in this web of trust, uh, this trust network. Uh, so web of trust is terminology that has been around for a long time. It's used in PGP and other uh, trust-based systems uh, that have to form the sort of subject, subjective consensus around facts. Um, can, uh, can you talk about how the web of trust is, is built in Identify? Like if, if, I'm, if I have an identity on Identify, uh how do uh how, what does that look like like how do i link to other people that and how do they um how do they uh provide uh assertion or not that some facts that i'm saying about myself are true or how, how does that work uh well when you look at the pgp web of trust uh, a great example out there is the bitcoin otc the bitcoin over the counter web of trust um what you basically do is you create a key pair so you have a public key and you have a private key. And if I choose to sign your public key with my private key, <coughs> pardon me, then I um, thereby add you as a first degree connection to my own web of trust. So uh, I can do this with multiple identities and I, I create a personalized uh, trust network in this way. And if I add you to my, uh, uh, as a first connection to my network, and for example, if I don't have uh, Meher um, in my own network as a first connection, but you do, then Meher becomes a second degree connection through you uh, for me. So this is how you create your own network and how it works to uh, um, in degrees. So it works in an exponential way. So if I have, let's say that I would have uh, 200 people um, within my own network on a first degree level, and if these people all have, um, let's say, also a certain amount of, of people as first-degree connections, which I don't have as first-degree connections myself, then I might have 200 people in my first-degree network, but to a second degree, I might have 50,000 people in my network. And in a third degree, I might have already have like 7 or 10 million people in my own network. So this is how you create your own network, and you start relatively small. But the larger it grows, uh, the, the more exponential the, the, the power of the network becomes. So the, the further it scales, the, the better it works. Okay, so I'm interested in also, like, how, what, what does that look like? like? So, for instance, if we imagine uh, a user interface for, uh, for Identify, so say mm -hmm. you have a, a mobile app, um, we can talk about the client in just a minute, because what's interesting about Identify, too, is that you don't need... Uh, uh, heavy nodes. It, it works really well with lightweight clients, so you could have this on a phone or something like that. So on your phone, you'd have you'd create a a, a private key, 
and through some sort of through some way you would you would send your your public key to someone else you know it could perhaps be linked to facebook or something like that or some other social network the key would go to say mayor that i would send my key to and then mayor would sign my public key with his private key and that creates a connection in my first degree network yeah, so in the case, uh, the, the, the example that you're mentioning where you run it on a mobile phone, it's a bit of an hypothesis at the moment <clears throat> because the, right now the software only runs uh, within Linux. Um, but it should be able in the future, like you said, it's uh, the, the software itself, the daemon is uh, relatively lightweight, especially if you compare it to a node like uh, the Bitcoin daemon, for example. So let's say if you would, have, uh, if you would both have uh, a node running on your own phone, then you could connect to each other by uh, signing uh, each other's public key. So the node itself also has its own key pair. So what you can do is you can use your private key to sign uh, Meher's node uh, or his public key that belongs to his node and vice versa. Then what you will do from then on is any information that you store on your own node and that you decide to publish with the world will be flooded to Meher because he has added your node to his own node's web of trust. And by doing so, he chooses to store any data that you flood towards him. So um, if, if any information comes in, he can verify this by the signature. He will see that the public key that this signature belongs to um, is within its own web of trust. So it's a trusted key. And then these messages will be stored uh, in his own note. Can you explain what you mean by any information that I flood to him? So there are several types of, uh, of messages that you can send. You can, uh, after you've created a keeper, after you have uh, your public key, you can, uh, for example, add a URL to your Twitter account uh, or your LinkedIn or your Facebook, but only the URL. So the software itself has no need to look at the profile behind it. And you can also add a Bitcoin address or a name or a nickname or uh, that you live in a certain country. But that's one type of message that you can send, which is a connection. So you connect any type of identifier as an asset or a, uh, like an attribute to your identity, which is the public key. Um, the other type of messages are uh, the ones where you refute these kind of connections. So if you see that Meher has... Um, um, added my Facebook account to my name, and you see that it's the wrong one, then you can simply downvote it. So you can say, no, this is not correct. So that's the, that's another type of message where you refute a connection. And then there are the messages where you can send a rating. So I can say, uh, Sebastian is a, is a good barber or a good car salesman, and I can attach a score to that. So I could say, is a good car salesman, and I give you an eight out of 10, for example. So these are basically the, the three types of messages that you can send over the network. Now, of course, the, it would be refuted right away because I'm a horrible car salesman and <laughs> an even worse barber. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's take this scenario where, uh, like, Tim, you are the barber and Sebastian is in my, is a first degree connection for me in, in Identify. Mm -hmm. And let's say Brian is a second degree connection because Sebastian is connected to Brian. Mm -hmm. Now, in the first scenario, we assume that, um, like, because Sebastian is a first degree connection, if he sends me a message, I accept. I accept that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now, if if I have like say hundreds or thousands of first degree connections, then my mobile device cannot, or my I wouldn't want all of the messages that these connections make to be stored on my device because it would be like a lot of data, right? So mm -hmm. even though they're sending me messages, I, I might only ch keep a very small fraction of these messages, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so let's say now actually Sebastian has rated you as a barber, but I have not kept that message on my computer because I, I don't keep uh, whatever he sends to me. I trust mm -hmm. whatever he sends to me, but I don't keep it with me. And now I want to go to your shop and you are the barber and I want to see what does my web of trust say about Tim as a barber. Mm -hmm. How do I discover that Sebastian actually put something for you there? Uh, well, if you don't store the messages, then it's, of course, <clears throat> um, rather difficult to, uh, to, to make any decision based on that. 
but uh, I could still be able to show you those messages uh, as a barber because uh, he has sent the ratings to me. Um, I can choose to store those ratings. And whenever you walk into my shop and you say, well, do you have any uh, rating from these persons, for example, I could also show it to you the other way around. Uh, it doesn't sound very effective or very efficient uh, this way, but it, it is an option where I can show you the message and you can still verify that Sebastian has, um, uh, has signed this message because you can check the signature and the public key. And yeah, if that suffices for you, then that will be probably be uh, enough information for you to base your own decision on. And if you still don't trust me because you say you could say, okay, maybe you've generated this yourself, uh, the, the chance is highly unlikely, but you could still assume that, then you can still double check it um, with Sebastian if that information is correct or not. And that could be automated. So in a sense, like what I'm trying to ask is, this kind of approach seems to have like an inbuilt search problem, right? Like, uh, so what is what is really happening is everyone's writing, like, let's say, let's, let's assume a world in which everyone is using identify and everyone mm -hmm. is putting stuff about all of the interactions that are happening. If say I go to my barber shop, I put a rating for him there. I go to a car wash, I put a rating there. So everyone is generating a lot of reputational data. And uh, it seems to me that like in order to actually figure out what my web of trust says for somebody, I actually need some kind of search engine. Um, I actually seem to need some kind of search engine where uh, if I go to a shop, I can see what my web of trust said about it. Mm -hmm. But then the search engine is itself a point of centralization because we don't have a decentralized search engine, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, what you could do with um, <clears throat> the example where you don't store the information yourself, maybe there's there uh, will come at some point where there are so many messages that you simply can't store them on your phone. Um, in, the, in that scenario, you will need very you will need many connections and a lot of messages. Looking at what uh, what what mobile phones are capable of nowadays and uh, what the database size of an identified database is. But what you could do is you could also choose to trust a public node to store this information for you. So somebody could provide a service where they um, say, okay, if you want, you can also trust us. You can flood your information towards us. We will store it for you and you will pay, let's say, a certain fee uh, that could be per month or per API call per query. Um, and where it comes to, to searching, it's it's very interesting, I think, because um, if you look at centralized search engines, they, they basically always work based on blacklisting. So um, if you look at Google PageRank, for example, the, the most well-known reputation system in the world probably that basically everybody uses every day, um, you see that first they try to crawl through all the data. So they try to find all the data on the web. And the thing they do next is they try and filter out irrelevant information. So for example, stuff that has to do with uh, child pornography or terrorism, etc. Um, so they decide what you will get to see. But what you could do with something like identify is uh, you could you could turn that concept around. So you could have all the information available, and then I could filter by my own first degree connections or second degree connections. So for example, if I go look for a barber, um, I could either Google that to see what uh, which barber is closest by. But I could, if I would use something like identify, I could um, uh, look for a barber. I could first see if anybody, uh, if any of my first degree connections say anything useful about it. If they don't, I can then filter a bit more outwards uh, by my second degree connections to see if any of them has to say anything useful about any barber, uh, which is relevant for me. And this way I can, uh, personalize uh, search even further in a decentralized fashion. Okay, so um, in Identify, do you have any like uh, any namespace at all, or do you have a global list of names, a global address book, or something like that? Um, well, the, the the namespace itself is undefined, so it uses the public key namespace. Uh, you create a key pair, and you can basically attach any type and any value. Um, to your public key. So 
I could say um, the type is name, name is Tim Pastor. I could say uh, URL and Facebook account, or uh, I could say is over 18, yes, etc. So the, the namespace itself is totally undefined. So uh, this way it can be used for, um, uh, for example, if you look at Namecoin, you have uh, certain namespaces which are predefined that you can use. So you could also use these within Identify. Uh, but you're not limited to uh, to anything that's that's predefined in any way. So so there are no namespaces as such with identify, but you could always use something like one name or other services. You can bold them on if you wanted to. Yeah, right. Um, you could, uh, for example, attach a one name account to your identity. Uh, you could attach um, <clears throat> your uh, Uber your Uber uh, profile to your identity or your Airbnb profile, or you could create separate identity so that you create one identity that you link to your Uber and one that you link to your, uh, to your Facebook account, for example. So this way you can, um, you can decide for yourself which identity you want to link to which of your, uh, uh, to any of your social identities yourself. So with, with a system like this, and it's, same goes for you know, social networks and things like that is that, you know, you need your, it's mostly reliable, relying on, on network effects and, uh, you know, cause you want to be with your, where your friends are. And if, uh, uh, if uh, most people are using identify or some other identity system, um, well, I guess my question is, are you concerned about fragmentation in this space? Because there's other protocols out there. There's like the blockchain ID protocol, uh, which of course one name is using. Then you have Keybase, which is mostly for PGP, but you know one could imagine that they get into more identity um, based stuff uh, and then and then identify. Um, can there be multiple identity decentralized identity protocols in this space, sort of competing with each other? Are they compatible? Is, is what what are your views on that? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, identify could be complementary to uh, <clears throat> to many of those systems. So, for example, if you take one name um, and blockchain ID, I think it's a um, uh, it's a good example to prevent man in the middle attacks. So, if I want to verify an identity and I do it through a website, then I can I still do it through a centralized mechanism, and I can still become uh, a victim of a man in the middle attack. But when you publish, for example, your name and your public key to the blockchain, then you can double check it on the blockchain, which is immutable. So this way you can prevent a man in the middle attack. So um, I could create a one name account and I could attach it to my uh, to my identify profile. But this is this is all in a public setting where we use it for uh, to create our own personal networks on a more of a global scale. But what you could also do, uh, this is a bit more hypothetically, but theoretically uh, the proof of concept should prove that this works, is that if I have two information silos, um, I could add two identify nodes to each end, and then I could add a request handler. So I could say, okay, I have two information, <coughs> sorry, I have two information silos, which are uh, um, very difficult to connect to one another or to have them exchange data among each other. So what I could do is I could put an identify node or two between them with a request handler, and then I could send specific requests for specific information. And when I do that, I already know the public key of the other nodes. So any request that I send can be encrypted uh, purely for the node on the other end. And when that request is being handled by that node, they can, they can check According to their own web of trust, so to see if that information that that's being requested, if they uh, if that can be returned, and if it can be returned, it can be extracted from the database. Uh, it can be encrypted for the receiver on the other end because both parties know each other's public key, and then it can be sent back to the other party. So this way, you can not only use it for humans but also for machines. So you can also um, create trust networks for machines. Okay, and we'll, we'll we'll come back to machines in in a few minutes because that, that's something that, that I think I'm really interested in as well. But uh, but first, uh, coming back to identify, uh, let, let's talk about security a little bit. And because if if you're dealing with a decentralized identity system, 
conserving and preserving the integrity of your pub, of your private key is really important because then someone can just take your identity. Uh, what what happens with Identify when your private keys are stolen? Well, if you look at the the prototype on uh, identity.fi, um, it's a prototype for a front end. So anybody can download it from the GitHub, can run it for themselves. And what you can do there, or it's it's an example, you can log in uh, with your Facebook account on your node. And when I log in with my Facebook account, the only thing I do is I set up a session with with Facebook, and the node can verify that uh, that I've set up the session. So then the node will know that I am in control over this Facebook account. After I've done that, it will create key pair for me. So if I lose my control over my Facebook account, for example, I can uh, reset the password and uh, through my mail, I can use the forgotten password function uh, function on the Facebook website. Uh, and then I can reset my password through my mail and then I can log in again um, on my uh, on my identify node and then I will have, have access to that same key pair again. Um, so that's one solution that can be used. You could also use more privacy friendly options. So, uh, so, so just sorry, so you're, in, in, in that case, uh, the key pairs are being held by Identify and released to you when you sign in with Facebook? Did I understand that correctly? The Right now, um, when you when you have a note, then the note will generate a key pair for you. So in the future, you could run your own note. That's the idea. Or uh, you could generate this on the client side. Uh, you could use something as a BitAuth, for example, which was created by uh, Jeff Garcik and the team at BitPay, um, which uses the same principle where you have the idea that you type in um, an email address and a password, but this way you can actually generate a key pair on the client side. So this way you don't have to send a password to the under to the other end of the line, uh, and you can still prove via a signature that that's really you. So the only idea there for uh, logging in with Facebook or Twitter or Google or Mozilla Persona um, is that you prove that you are uh, the owner of, uh, let's say, a Twitter account. And when you do that, then the node will verify that. It will sign for you that um, that this Twitter account or this Google account has been checked. So next time, if I lose control over that account, I can reset the password and I can have access again to uh, to the keepers. And so you, one could also, I guess, use something like the FIDO protocol or something perhaps a bit if you really want to have control over your keys you could use something like a like a ledger to store the the private keys on on some other device or even on your mobile um uh, with the uh, secure element type stuff like i mean in, in in the future i presume that the idea is that this is somehow connected to biometric information right that you can prove your identity through iris scan or uh, or fingerprint data or some other biometric information. Uh, yeah, that could be personally, um, but this is this is my personal point of view. I'm not a really big fan of uh, biometrics um, because if you ever lose, you know, it's not really difficult to go door to door and get fingerprints of the doorknobs. Um, and after you've uh, you've changed your fingerprints ten times, you've run out of fingerprints. You can then use your toe prints, and then after time, uh, after ten times, you've also ran out. And the same thing goes for your iris. That if you, uh, if somebody has a copy of your iris or knows how to duplicate this in any way, then the rest of your life you will have issues with that. So that's that's just a small side note why I'm not a really big fan of biometric. Um, but what you could also do is use the multisig principle. So if I have, uh, let's say, I have three devices. I have uh, my laptop. Uh, a tablet and my phone they could all have their own identity and as soon as my phone gets stolen for example i can use the other two devices to downvote uh, the public key that belongs to the node on my phone and i can thereby automatically update everybody in my own network that my phone has been stolen or that it has been compromised um, and as soon as uh, if it turns out that for example my phone was uh, was in the fridge um, because I accidentally put it there, then um, I can simply upvote that key pair again, and then I can let everybody in my own trust network know I can flood this information to them like, oh, I found it again. Um, this device is still trusted. So I think the, the, 
the multisig principle is really interesting here. Also, where it comes to generating key pairs uh, through uh, social media accounts, for example. So if I would lose control over my Facebook account, and if I had no way to regain access anymore, I could use two other accounts or three or five to downvote that, ag- that account and um, update everybody in my own trust network that that account uh, has been compromised. Today's magic word is identity. I-D-E-N-T-I-T-Y. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. In the conversation that went by, uh, the question of like identity for devices came up. Mm-hmm. Like, is the Internet of Things and identity linked in some way? Yeah, I believe so. Um, because l- let's take the example of a fridge. Um, if I would run an identify node in my in my fridge somewhere in the future, and my neighbor would do the same thing, then when my neighbor um, orders food let's say uh, they order milk and once the once the milk arrives once it has been delivered it turns out that the milk has uh, has, ex- has expired um, what you can then do is that if that fridge is in the trust network of my own fridge it can send a message to my fridge that they have ordered milk from a particular supplier that it has arrived maybe on time but that the milk itself already was expired when it arrived and then from there I could um, if I control my own fridge, I control the node on my own fridge, I control the software on my own fridge, and I could set a threshold that if anybody, if any first degree connection uh, receives anything that has expired, uh, not to order from that supplier in the next two or three days, for example. But this way, you can use, you can tie identities to devices. Um, and when you look at, um, you could run an ident- another example, you could run an identify node as a sort of a firewall. So uh, for the Internet of Things, where it comes to your home, where you have an, uh, a garage door connected to the Internet or uh, the lighting in your house, if I would use an identify firewall, uh, a sort of firewall, uh, a node running within my own home, I could say only my phone, only my tablet can connect with that device. And... If it doesn't contain the right signature, this message, then it will simply do nothing. So in that case, somebody could hack my Wi-Fi connection, but as long as they don't have the private keys that belong to the devices, which are whitelisted to control those devices, they still can't do anything to it. So we talk a lot about it, uh, you know, decentralized systems and, and how they'd be great for IoT. You know, there's been a lot of talk about that. And of course, you know, there's been some proof of concepts run by IBM and, and others. But it, I have a hard time seeing how that's going to play out exactly. And so let's taking identify, it, it's, it's obvious that this is, would be a good system for, um, for IoT, for devices to have identities. And you know, we can go even further and say that like a, an Ethereum DAP could have an identity. Uh, but specifically regarding IoT, what incentive would device manufacturers have to implementing this type of technology in um in their devices well i think first of all security um because if your uh, if your fridge can hack your car uh then we have a big problem so you want to ensure that only trusted devices can communicate can communicate with each other so i think that's probably the the most interesting proposition for uh, for hardware uh, uh suppliers and is that so is there an ins- a specific incentive for them to implement a decentralized system like this because they already have systems, uh, security systems that you know will manage permissions and things like that they're, you know they're centralized of course uh, but if, if you had to go to a device manufacturer and say like um, because I mean we'll talk about your, your company later that's essentially I think one of the things that you do is try to promote this technology if you had to go to I don't know uh, Fitbit or like Samsung and you had to tell them all right I, we have this technology, it can benefit your customers. How would you sell it as opposed to like a centralized system of permissions that they would implement? Well, I think that the major difference there would be that um, if, if any hardware supplier would use this uh, within their own hardware, then they would have 
a very big advantage compared to the competition because a decentralized system, it, it means that uh, you as a user who buys their hardware has control over whatever you buy. So um, it's very privacy friendly, it's very secure. And I think that's a very interesting selling point, especially because there doesn't necessarily have to be a trade-off with usability here. And that's normally the issue that if you want security, then you have a trade-off with usability and the other way around. Um, but with this system, you can have security on the back end and you can build very secure uh, uh, UX-friendly applications on top of that. And I don't think there's any system out there at the moment which uh, uh, which lets you do that. So I think they would have a big advantage over any of their competition if they would do that. This is like a very interesting concept. What you are saying is uh, basically just as we think that humans will have, uh, so in your system, every human has a subjective view of the world about um, the reputation of other humans or, you know, Similarly, like machines could have their own subjective view of the world about uh, the competence of other machines, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. yes. So, so basically, um, yeah. I I don't I don't even know how to how to take a good example with it, but uh, like like my drone could rate your drone that your drone has a tendency to run into i don't know windows and break them or something like that so and uh, and some other drone could look at what my drone has it has has rated your drone for and conclude something about your drone so, something like this right yeah it's something like that or you could um you could connect the two so you could have drones uh that that establish permissions for each other for example or if they build up a good reputation with each other because they don't fly through each other's airspace i don't know um, then that they will start sharing more permissions if the owner of the drone decides that that's a good case. But you can also combine that these devices with humans. So um, I could use this software to find a drone operator which is best suited for me to deliver a fragile package, for example. Um, but another, which is maybe a more interesting case where it comes to hardware, is probably trust-based mesh routing. So if I trust certain uh, routing devices, then I could choose to send information only through trusted parties. Um, and you could all do this through a public key cryptography. So I think it's, it's a very secure way to um, connect both humans and devices. I mean, like, like your ideas, they all seem, seem very awesome. It's like what I like about, about what we have talked until now is... Uh, it's decentralized. Uh, the data is open, and um, and and basically this can scale infinitely, right? Like if you have, if you basically solve the search search problem, how do I figure out search for data? Then then you can you can you can scale it really well. Like the the kind of questions I I I'm 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 having in my mind are a it it seems like a complex system, right? Like everyone needs to. Everyone needs to have their own identity, certify the identities of other people, then give reputations on on other people, and only when it ge gets to a certain scale, it it becomes useful. And it's it and it seems very similar to the uh, PGP web of trust. So I'm kind of wondering, and 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 recently I was at the Ethereum DevCon. And there, uh, in, in the Ethereum team, you have this person who's called Vinay Gupta. I'm, I'm not sure if you if you have heard of him. Uh, he's an old cipherpunk from the 90s. And he was talking about this PGP web of trust. And what he was saying is that the ideas were of building a web of trust have been around for a long time. The, the ideas for building a web of trust have been around for a long time. And the reason they did not, they did not actually permeate through into society is because their user interfaces and uh, applications were just too complex. Like nobody wanted to handle private keys and nobody wanted to go to key signing parties and build this actual web of trust. Mm. Do you have any ideas in on this dimension? How do you make it usable? So uh, uh, Phil Zimmerman, who is the inventor of PGP. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Not sure what's up there. Okay, I'll rewind. 
Um, so Phil Zimmerman, the inventor of PGP, he uh, recently said, uh, I read a news article about this, that he believes that PGP isn't user-friendly enough. And he used that as the excuse for why he doesn't use it himself. So the inventor of PGP claims he doesn't use it because it isn't user-friendly enough. So um, when you look at identify, then on the back end, it's very technical. It's uh, rather complex. Um, as you can see right now, it's already difficult to explain the concept itself. It's uh, rather uh, abstract. But once you grasp that, then you can build very secure applications on top of it, which can be very user-friendly. So if you go to identity.fi, for example, um, I, I'll admit it's not the most intuitive user interface at the moment, but it's a prototype. It's also a proof of concept to prove that you can build something on the front end, which is relatively uh, user-friendly, uh, which communicates through the API with the back end uh, to combine it with security. And this way you don't need the trade-off between usability and security in order to uh, to use a web of trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 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 do you see like any any use case like like part of the challenge here is like pure network effect. Like I I already have a list of friends on Facebook, and you could think of my friends list as me having signed the public keys of my other friends. Really, um, you could see it that way. So uh, there are already these networks that handle identity and reputation. Do you see any particular place where uh, Identify could have a foothold that? Well, one of the most interesting possible use cases I see myself is probably bitcointalk.org. Um, it's interesting for multiple reasons. First of all, that uh, Sirius, who uh, Marty Momi, who created Identify, is also the guy who set up uh, bitcointalk.org originally. Um, so there's, there's a nice connection there, but I primarily mean it because if you go to bitcointalk.org, if you are familiar with the forum, then you'll probably know that there are a lot of trolls, there are a lot of sock puppets. Uh, so, so for most people, there's a lot of irrelevant information there. So if you would have a browser plugin that would connect to your identify node, um, you could simply downvote all the trolls. And if you would do that, and I would trust you, and you would decide to share uh, your own web of trust with me or your own filter of what you have filtered. So um, then I could apply this filter to my own view. So this way uh, you could make it a business to downvote trolls and I could pay you, for example, a uh, uh, pair update to, uh, to use your filter on top of, uh, on top of the Bitcoin talk.org forum. So this way, oh. I could filter by relevant information based on my own web of trust. And I think that that forum is a very interesting example. And I'm uh, curious to see if anybody will pick up this idea. Well, that could be really useful in a lot of places, not just Bitcoin talk, I guess. Right, yeah. Uh, every, everywhere on the internet. Um, Agreed. So let's just sort of, I would like to talk about the future of identity and where you see this going. So uh, right now, obviously, the most trusted source of identity, I think, without a doubt, is national identity cards, so the, the identity that the government vets um, is, is our true identity, um, at least in a broad circle and perhaps in a, in a close circle, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, but uh, what, where do you see, what do you see as the future for gov government identities and will we continue to, to have government identities as sort of the trusted ID, you know, when you go somewhere and you need to show your ID that you will show this? Or do you see that as something re resembling more identify that's more decentralized and where you have multiple parties vetting your identity? Um, I see, I basically see two possible scenarios. The first one is the one where big corporations will issue our identities and uh, will therefore have the control over the data and the communications that is linked to our identities. We already see this with uh, Facebook and Google and LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, but I think it can go even further because right now here in the Netherlands, they're working on a, on a new digital ID system and it will basically be controlled by the big corporations. So that's one option, one possible scenario I see. The other one, um, which is uh, a bit more uh, hypothetical, is the one where the whole world would be using identify um so what you could do there is if i would create an identity 
uh, I could have it signed by the government. So next, I could simply bring my public key to anybody else who also trusts uh, the government that has issued that verification to my ID. And I could simply show them, look, I am a real person and that has been verified by the government. Um, so if they then also have that government within their own web of trust, they can verify the signature. But you don't necessarily need the government for that because if I live in a small village where everybody trusts uh, the local barber again or the local butcher, then they could do the same verification. They know that I am Tim Pastor. I come there every day. So if the butcher uh, has verified that I am Tim Pastor, then most other merchants in this small village will also trust that I am Tim Pastor because they trust the butcher. So in this way, it becomes um, this way you see that information silos start to break up and that humans themselves can have more control over their own identities. Um, another interesting thing there is where it comes to those verifications, you could uh, theoretically have a, a hierarchical deterministic verifications. So, for example, the, the DMV or uh, the, the DVLA, as it's called in the UK, um, can issue a driver's license to me, which could be hierarchical deterministic, which means that every time I have to show my driver's license, for example, at a routine check, when the cops pull me over, I could show my identity. I could uh, create new verification out of the master key that uh, the, the, the DMV has provided to me. And I could then show them, okay, look, this is my identity and it has been verified that I have my driver's license. Then the cop can, could simply uh, scan a QR code, for example, and they will see a green check mark. Okay, this is all right. They can double check it with DMV, with their note, and they will see, okay, this person really has a driver's license. But next time that a cop pulls me over, I could create another verification from the same master key. Uh, so I could, I could create a new identity per interaction. Uh, and this way, it becomes much more difficult to link uh, multiple interactions to one identity. So I think that's much more privacy friendly. So these are just a few of the options that I see possible uh, with a system like, Ident like Identify or any other system like that that will hopefully one day come out on top. So what you're saying is you're decoupling uh, the fact that you have a di driver's license from your ID, uh, from your identity. So if essentially you can tell that police officer, okay, I have a driver's license but, uh, while staying private. And I guess you could also do this for age verification. So for, uh, for instance, if you're buying alcohol, uh, you could simply prove to the person in front of you that you are 21. If you're in the States, if you're sort of parts of Canada, you're 18. Uh, and if you're in France or Europe, then you're like 12. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and without showing your, um, without actually giving up your, your identity, which I, I guess could be valuable, but I think could also be seen by the state as uh, something that is undesirable. Um, I, I had one last question before we move on to, uh, to your company, Two Way. Uh, All right. So we talked about the, this idea that um, devices and perhaps even applications could have identities. Do you see a problem arising from the fact that humans and artificial intelligence applications, devices share the same type of identity system? Do you see problems perhaps arising from that or do you think that's totally fine? I don't really see a problem there because um, if the user has control over the machine, then it shouldn't be a problem. But when one's artificial intelligence and uh, deep learning, etc., uh, finally becomes like a real big thing, then uh, you could have some other implications. But I'm not too scared of that at this moment. Yeah, the 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 machines could all downvote us uh, in in mass, right? Yeah, if the could, machines but... turn man malevolent, they'll all downvote us and screw us out of the web of trust. Yeah, but the thing is that if somebody downvotes you, they only remove you from their own personalized uh, network. So it will only have an influence on themselves and the, the parties that decide to listen to them and trust them, of course, um, because they can also see that information and they can see that a certain machine perhaps doesn't trust the human. Um, and then the other machine, which is controlled by another human, uh, 
could be able to decide for itself whether it still wants to communicate with uh, the untrusted human, or so to say. So that's that's a very interesting uh, that's a very interesting case to think about a bit more. Uh, but as long as people keep control over their machines, I don't see this as a big issue because um, uh, identify itself it doesn't try to automate trust. Uh, it just collects everything that's being set. It presents it, so it organizes trust, and then the human will always have to make the decision on uh, what they want to do with that information or not. Okay, cool. So, uh, so one final top topic before we close off this this great interview right. uh, is, um, yeah, you have a company which is Two Way Dot IO. right? And this company is different from the Identify protocol itself. Right? Identify is the protocol. And two way dot io is the company. So, what is two way dot io trying to do? What are you going after? Uh, the main goal at the moment is to uh, to stimulate the um, the development of identify itself. So, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a platform for uh, for developers to make it more accessible. Identify the software itself. Uh, so that's uh, documentation. We're working on setting up a forum. Uh, a wiki for the documentation and we're also trying to create a platform where developers can come together um, to build things together based on identify so that's one, one that's that's basically our main goal um, and we're trying to support this through building custom solutions for customers um, and we also do consultancy work where it comes to blockchain identity and reputation Cool. Well, uh, that sounds uh, very interesting, and of course, uh, you know, I, I think this, you know, this is a really interesting um, sort of idea that we could have decentralized identities. It, it really disrupts sort of you know, centuries and perhaps millennia of the way that we've thought about identity. Much like Bitcoin has really disrupted the way that we think about uh, about money. So, um, yeah, I thought I think this was really a good interview, and I'm really interested in seeing uh, where this is going to go in the future. So, thanks a lot for coming on today. Thank you very much. And uh, I really enjoyed being on. And if you have any further questions or uh, anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Uh, you can go to identity.fi and uh, look me up or uh, simply Google me. Great. And we'll have links to that in the show notes as well. So uh, that's it for our show today. Uh, Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the LTB network, and you can find a lot of great shows and content about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies, and all that stuff at letstalkbitcoin.com. We release new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcasting app on iOS or Android. And also, you can watch the videos on YouTube, of course. And uh, if you're a loyal listener to the show, you can always leave us a, a review on iTunes or, uh, or anywhere else, really, that you can leave us reviews. We greatly appreciate it. And if you do so, just send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will send you a free Epicenter t-shirt. That's right. You just leave us a review. It could be, you know, just whatever you want to say, you know, just uh, leave us a review and we'll send you a t-shirt. And uh, of course, uh, you can always send us a tip and the tipping address will be in the show description. There is one more thing I want to add. We're looking for developers. So uh, we're looking for a, a WordPress developer to help us build a new website. It's not a very big job, but uh, we still need someone to help us do it because I personally don't have time anymore to work on that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you, if uh, you know, if you can, if you're good with WordPress and uh, building templates and things like that, please reach out to us. You can reach out at show at epicenterbitcoin.com as well. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.